<clears throat> we were talking this morning, coming in, coming in. If you're not praying for rain, you need to start that. You need to start praying for that serious business, and for us to be able to live here and and for the church to thrive here. We, we got this bad habit. We need water, and we need quite a bit of it. So, uh, pray that you'll do that. Um, Revelation 17. And verse 14, to me, is one of the key verses uh, in the book of Revelation. It says that these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So even though there's a, probably another 230 years where Rome's still going to still be in charge. Now, they're weakening. They're weakening big time. And it's said that over the next roughly two to three hundred years, at least 100,000 Christians will be killed. So the message is clear. We win. But there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering and death before that happens. Um, look at verse uh, 5 and verse 6 of chapter 17. <clears throat> and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw this woman. We're going to look at who, who is this woman. We'll talk about that in a second. Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled, <clears throat> pardon me, with great amazement. Uh, who is this woman? Pardon? Well, look at, verse, uh, look at verse 18 of chapter 17. And the woman who you saw is, uh, is that great city uh, which reigns over the kings of the earth. So he's talking about this woman being a, a met obviously a metaphor for, for um, a city. Now, if you take the early date, 70 A.D., which I don't, I, I believe it's overwhelming evidence for the late date, but some do, fine, uh, then that city would be Jerusalem and the 70 A.D. and the fall of, and all of that. And you can make a case for that. If you take the later date, this 96 to 100 A.D., somewhere in there, <clears throat> then, then it's pretty clear that this is Rome. This city that's drunk on the blood of the saints who has killed all of God, or not all, has killed a lot of God's people. And he's, he warns here in verse 17, now you need to come out of her. And, for, and also chapter 18 too, you better come out of her. Because if you don't, you're going to share in, in, the, in, the, um, in the tribulation that's coming for Rome. So I, I think almost every scholar will tell you that, that this, this is talking about Rome. This woman, it's, it's in symbolic language, no question about that. But the fact that, that, that God uses, and Jesus uses here, the, the, the terms, these metaphors, uh, Babylon. You know, he didn't say St. Louis, or he didn't say Cyprus. Uh, Babylon meant something, or he wouldn't have used it. And he keeps using it over and over. So we're going to look this morning a little bit about <coughs> Babylon the original city of Babylon and why he would use that metaphor to describe this woman who is Rome and some similarities there. I think it's, a, I think it's kind of an interesting study, uh, really. Um, also look at verse 17 of chapter 17. I think this is a lesson even for today. <clears throat> for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose. So what, what, what does that say or what does that imply? Is God active? <laughs> Almost a rhetorical question. Of course he's active. And it says that his will was implemented in Babylon times. His will was implemented in Roman times. And God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His will is. He uses kingdoms. He uses presidents. 
He uses uh, world powers to, to, to play out his plan. And they're not always pleasant people. They never have been. Sometimes he uses evil people. And sometimes he'll use a, uh, an evil people to destroy this evil people. And guess who's next in line? He's going to take care of them too. He always has. So with that in mind, the saints win. The lamb overcomes. God's will is always done. And sometimes, and a lot of times, he uses evil people to, uh, to uh, accomplish his, his purposes. <clears throat> now, let's go back, if you would. Here's my little detour. It may take eight or ten minutes. That's okay, actually. It's going to, we'll be fine in 17 and 18. <clears throat> Pardon me. Go back to, to Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. We're going to go back not to the metaphorical Babylon. We're going to go back to Babylon uh, and some things that Isaiah said in, in Isaiah 13, 19 through 22. Isaiah 13, 19 through 22. I'm going to read that. And we'll take a second. <clears throat> and Babylon, the glory of, the king, of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be a, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The word caper, it just means to jump and frolic and that kind of thing. The hyenas <clears throat> will howl in their citadels, the jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. Now, you're, we're in that area. Go just real quickly to Jeremiah 50. Um, same kind of message, but just a little different wording I like. <clears throat> Jeremiah 50, verse 35 through maybe 40, something like that. Jeremiah 50, 35. And I notice how many times, I've got it highlighted in my Bible, how many times God uses the word sword describing Babylon, what's going to happen. Didn't say feather. He said a sword. A sword is against the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, says the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon, against her princes and her wise men. A sword is against the soothsayers, and they will be fools. A sword is against her mighty men, and they will be dismayed. A sword is against their horses, against their chariots, and against all the mixed peoples who are in her midst, and they will become women. A sword is against her treasuries, and they will be robbed. A drought is against her waters, and they will be dried up, for, for it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. Therefore a wild desert beast shall dwell there, and jackals, and the ostriches shall dwell there. It shall be inhabited no more forever. Now, this is the original Babylon. Now, first of all, uh, where is Babylon? What country would we call it today? Uh, Iraq. Babylon's about 60 miles south of Baghdad. Give you some idea. Alan's been there uh, in that area. Uh, about 60 miles south of, of Baghdad. Um, in 1983, Saddam Hussein decided, 83 to about 86, decided he was going to rebuild Babylon. Spent over a billion dollars. He was going to rebuild the walls. And just like he, he viewed himself as Nebuchadnezzar, he, he put his name on all the capstones that went over around the wall, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. Well, how did that work for him? Is Babylon inhabited today? The, the water table miraculously raised during that time and got into all the palaces and all the things that he, that he was redoing. And you know who lives there today? Uh, jackals, owls, and all the wild animals frolicking. It's a marsh. It's inhabitable. Now, not too many miles from there, there's a city of about 500,000 people today but not Babylon. God says that city will never be inhabited. 
Saddam Hussein decided that it would be. Saddam Hussein lost. The Bible is as you can take it to the bank. If he says it'll never be inhabited, it will never be inhabited, and it has not. They have a caretaker there. They have a caretaker there who kind of oversees things, and they have some tourists going through, but it's not inhabited. It's, it's uninhabitable, just like God said it would be. Um, I, I just find that so interesting. Um, you know that Alexander the Great died there. When he took over the world, uh, he died there, and uh, i got to write, write that down, I can't remember all that, in 323 uh, B.C. Of course, in between, you've had the, the Persians and the Medes, and you remember all that from Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar, his son Belshazzar, having a big party, having a big time. And remember what happened that, when that, remember that? A finger came on the wall and wrote, You've been found wanting. And that very night he was killed. That's Babylon. <clears throat> and God uses the word Babylon throughout the book of Revelation for a reason. There's lessons to be learned there, in my, in my, in my opinion. Um, also, when you go back to Genesis 2 or 3, 2, I think, go back to Genesis 2, what started? The civil, did world civilization, there was a Garden of Eden near there? It absolutely was. It absolutely was. Because you remember it says that a river ran through the Garden of Eden. And what did it do? It branched off into four smaller rivers. One of them was the Euphrates River. Gihon and all the others. I, hard to pronounce. But one of them was the Euphrates River. Is the Euphrates River still there today? Where is it? Not far from there. So this is the cradle of civilization. This is where it all started. Remember the, the Sumer, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, uh, all of that? That's where the world started, right in the Middle East, in Iraq, in that area today. Or at least that's what it's called today. Questions or comments or anything you'd like to add to that? Because God, he keeps using the word Babylon. He must be some lesson for us. Don, <clears throat> pardon me, Don. <clears throat> birthplace of Abraham is just a little bit south of there within walking distance. That's right. That's right. Um, the, the, that's where it all started. Uh, in Babylon, you remember one of the seven uh, wonders of the world uh, was the hanging gardens. Remember that? Um, it was terraced almost like a pyramid, maybe 100 feet high or 150 feet high, very high. And the uh, Nebuchadnezzar did that for his wife, who was homesick, for her, where she came from. And so he built her these famous hanging, <clears throat> hanging gardens. They're very prideful people. Oh, did Nebuchadnezzar learn anything from this? <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, he was a very prideful guy. What did God tell him? What, what did he do to him, I should say? Yeah, you will learn, big boy, that God rules in the affairs of men. And he, oh, thank you, Tom. He, um, he took him out and he wandered as a, as a beast, eating, eating grass like a beast for, for a long time. Uh, he had to learn that lesson. His son did not learn that lesson, Belshazzar. We just saw that. All right, I, that's all, I know that's history, and I love history. But anyway, that does apply to Revelation. It really does. Uh, Babylon. Now, <clears throat> I'll talk just a minute about Rome. Because Rome, this, this woman that sits on the seven hills, does Rome sit on seven hills today? Yes, it does. Uh, why does God use that language? He uses uh, their words, words we can understand. We may not understand all of the, uh, uh, the metaphors and the symbology, but uh, he uses um, uh, some things. I, give, I think he gives us some clues, like dropping breadcrumbs a little bit. And in fact, Rome uh, was noted as, as the city of the seven hills, sits on seven hills. And he uses that term when we drop down into um, 
chapter 17 and verse, anybody see it, yell it out. Uh, uh, verse 9. sits on seven mountains. It's basically seven hills. So uh, Rome is the capital, obviously, of the Roman Empire. And it's the capital of the Roman Empire until roughly about 486. Um, I, I've seen different dates there. I wouldn't be adamant about the date. But in that late 300s to mid 400s, um, Rome was getting weak. There was corruption, sexual immorality. Um, they were actually, they were going broke. They were shaving off, they were putting less silver in their coins. Inflation, government control, severe government control, persecution of people trying to do right. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, we're talking about Rome. Scary. Describes us. God said, I'm taking you down. And we're going to see when we get into 18, which we'll get into Wednesday night, the part of it, where he says, you kill my people, and you're, you're big on drinking and all of that. I'm going to issue you a double. You kill my people. You're going to suffer double. And, and that, that kind of figurative language. God doesn't take it kindly when you kill his people, when you persecute his people. He never has, and he doesn't today. But what does God say about vengeance? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He takes care of his business, and he will avenge his people. But that's not to say people won't die or be persecuted just like they were then. Just like they were in Daniel's time. Just like they were in the time of Babylon. That kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> in 330 A.D., when the, they divided the Roman Empire up into the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. As Rome was falling, and it did, uh, Constantine, the emperor, moved to Constantinople. Get it? He, they like to name cities after themselves. And they, that became the Eastern Roman Empire. It lasted a 1,000 years. So he said, all oh, this is going to fall. Well, it's falling. It's falling. The, the Western part did fall. And lots and lots of problems there. So he just pulled up stakes and went over to what we would call modern-day Istanbul in Turkey. So he went from Iraq to, 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 um, to Constantinople, uh, which today is Istanbul, Turkey, which is the capital of Turkey. No, that's not right. I think it's Ankara. Anyway, Istanbul, Turkey, a large, major, major city. Uh, that was the Eastern Roman Empire, very fortified city, and it lasted between 800 and 1,000 more years before it totally fell. And Constantine called it New Rome. New Rome. And oh, by the way, I'll name it after me, Constantinople. Great city at that time for a long time. But it finally got corrupt and fell as well. So... What we're reading in Revelation 17 and 18, and what we've read so far, it's, it's like a drama a, 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 that unfolds. But when you know the end, and he's already told the end, we win. But there's a lot of drama in between. That's where we are in Revelation. <clears throat> and I think that's why he uses, uses Rome, and he use, uses... Uh, of Babylon for us to, to get the message and go back and study. If you haven't gone back to Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and read a little bit about Babylon, it'll bring this to life. It, it does to me. May, may, maybe it does, won't, won't to you. I think it will. But it brings it to life. Otherwise, we uh, re read words and don't understand it. Uh, it's like that a preacher told me one time. He said, if you don't get lessons, uh, if you're preaching and, and you're given a lesson and uh, and, and, it, and there's nothing, there's no application, you're just showing off. I think that's true. We've got to get lessons from this, or what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. Really? It's interesting, 
but what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? Does that make any sense at all? Okay, I see some heads nodding. I'm happy with that. <laughs> all right, that's good. <clears throat> um, the end of 17, we touched on verse 14, one of the key verses in all of Revelation. If you don't have that highlighted, when you get home, highlight Revelation 17 and verse 14. And then also in another color highlight in verse 17, that all these things works according to God's purpose. I highlight that one too. All right. Let's look. Any questions or comments? Let me open it up just a second. Uh, Don? I don't know. You'll tell us, though, I'm sure. Huh? Eastern Orthodox, and we got the political Rome and it's falling. What's the third part? I don't know. Tell us. I don't know either. Well, I don't know. <laughs> what you put me on the spot like that for, Don? <laughs> I don't know, Don. Yeah. But if, if we look at the two beasts and the split, the right. government and religion. Right. Religion has got to play a part in there someplace. It does. No, I think that's 100% right, Don, but it's above my pay grade. It's out there in the <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think that's absolutely so. But I can't explain it. And if you can't explain it, we're in big trouble. <laughs> big trouble. Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> we'll get a few verses, maybe five or six verses today, and then we will uh, finish it up on Wednesday night. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. <clears throat> and he cried mightily or loudly or loudly with a, mightily with a loud voice. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And has, had, and has come a, become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Now there's some, I may not take the time this morning, but I'm going to write this down. Isaiah 21 verse 9, Isaiah 14, verse 23. Uh, that, there's a little bit of background information there as well if you'd like to go back on your own and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, study that. Question number one up here. How is the angel coming down from heaven described? Give me, how is that angel described? Great Having great authority. What else? Very bright. I don't think I'd ever noticed that before, the bright part. But very noticeable, very bright. And what else? A mighty voice. A mighty voice. <laughs> I won't get into that. The news conference last week with a whisper, and I won't get into that. Uh, <laughs> loud voice. What does that indicate? Power, authority. Does, does, does a loud voice get your attention? Yes. So this angel, is, his appearance is bright. He has great authority. And he gets your attention. He's not somebody to be trifled with. So when he's announcing this, you know, it's like you, you stand up a little bit straighter. Because... This, 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 this personality here has, uh, has got something to say. And he's going to say it in verse 2. What does the angel cry out with this mighty voice, with this bright appearance, uh, with this, this one of great authority? What does he say? 
You can yell it. That will be just fine. Uh, Babylon has fallen. And what else do you say? It's fallen. For emphasis, Babylon has fallen. Does that sound like past tense or present tense or future tense? Past tense. Babylon's fallen. Wait, we just looked. He's not going to be fallen for a while. For, for two or three hundred years in the west and maybe 800 to 1,000 years in the, in the east. 1,000 years in one day and one day is 1,000 years. God says it's fallen. And you can take it to the bank. And it did fall. It did fall. Um, and it's become a dwelling. Well, what are some of these metaphors? Oh, what, what picture? Maybe that's a better way to say it. What picture do you see in the last part of the conditions in this great city? Miserable. Miserable. How's it smell, so to speak? Foul. We've, we've all smelled that. I lived in Iowa, we, we, there were hog farms there. In Kentucky, we'd have one out back, we'd throw scraps to it and we'd eat it later, you know, when he was ready. There, they have whole farms of nothing but, and you could smell those hog farms for miles and miles. They said it smelled like money, the locals, not to me. When we first moved there, Bronica said, what is that smell? I said, I don't know, Bronica, this is, not, maybe we made a mistake moving here, but uh, not good. A foul, think of the most foul smell. That's, that's kind of the picture that God gives here. That it, 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 it's, it's, it's a place of, of demons, as it were. It, even the, uh, every unclean bird, were there unclean birds in the Old Testament? Yeah, there were. So you get that mental picture. These people understood the Old Testament. They get that picture. And it just has a foul smell there, uh, metaphorically. So um, that's the picture that this mighty, bright, loud, magnificent angel paints. Babylon, you're, you're, it's, it's fallen, it's fallen. And then we, then we get this picture. So we can kind of get our minds around that a little bit. We know that those are uh, uh, symbolic. We understand that. But it, but it means something. It means something. Questions, comments uh, so far? Uh, okay, let's look at question number three, based on verse three. How is the influence of the harlot on the world described? Powerful countries, powerful cities have an influence on the world. What kind of influence did she have? Well, she, she covered it all, didn't she? G give me some of those. And that's a good point. Okay. Uh, uh, morals. And what else? What about commerce? We're going to see that as we get down toward the last third of the, chapter 18. Commerce. Were people making a lot of money off of this situation? Yes. Now, they're going to be moaning and crying here soon because it's going to go away. But uh, morals, commerce, um, uh, spiritual condition, you can almost name all of those. Donnie, what else? Well, the city of Corinth it, it defines all of these things. Mm -hmm. With the immorality of the foreign <clears throat> Right. And, and the corruption there between the idol worship and just the plain debauchery yeah. that took place in Corinth. And you multiply that by all of the cities around the world that Rome had an influence on. And it's, it's mind-boggling. It, it really is when you read about it, the influence Rome had on the world. And all of the different areas where she was corrupting, corrupting the world. Uh, and the Christians are, some of them, did some of the Christians get involved in that? Some gave up. Some Christians gave up and went back, and they're going to suffer for that. Um, 
You, you make application to today. Do, do all those things seem to apply today in all those different areas, morals, uh, commerce, uh, the, uh, the influence that, uh, that we have on others, all of this uh, immorality, the sexual immorality, and people don't know who they are anymore. Yes. We have to be careful lest we become involved in that and suffer for that. Yep, that's, that's for sure. He said, you've got to come out of her, my people. Got to come out of all this. And he gave a warning. Uh, uh, many did, many didn't. Some didn't. Okay, questions, comments on that? Um, Lisa. So, when you brought up the point that, you know, that someone has fallen, and even though this is all still going on, mm -hmm. I think that as humans, we don't realize that the writing's already on the wall. Like, God said, it has fallen. Even though we still are making a difference, and we're still, whatever, you know, holding on to something, it has fallen. And I think that so often, sin is like that. The pandemic, right? You're, you're already so deep into it. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's a great point. The handwriting's on the wall. We just saw that with Belshazzar. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. And there's a lot of sayings that come from these times that we still use. The handwriting's on the wall. Yeah, and God wrote it. Uh, but it is. But in God's eyes, this has already taken place. And uh, we win. But it's not to say it can't get rough, and it probably will be. We, we don't know those things. That's, that's in his hands, and we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, but can anybody undo that? He says, we've just been reading in Proverbs, when God says it's done, in Psalms 2, it's done, isn't it? He said, can anybody instruct me? Can anybody undo what I say is going to be done? And, and what is he doing today, Gary? Failing. But is he still trying? Still, doing. still trying. But he loses too. He's going to find himself in the abyss as well <laughs> at the end. We, 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 we see that. Good points. Really good points. Don? When you look at, at controlling the world, Rome was still sitting in a position of power with armies out <clears> through the world controlling what was going on. But they were already losing control. They lost control before Christ was born when Mark Anthony went rogue. You know, if, if we look at it that way, they could not control the legions scattered out in the world at the time John was writing this. So in many respects, Rome had already lost because they were no longer in total control of their armies, which were controlling the world. And that gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Yeah, between the Gothic, the Goths, and the and the uh, the Germanic peoples, they just slowly start pecking away at Rome's authority, and Rome starts pulling their horns in, so to speak. Horns, get it? From Revelation 17, uh, pulling their horns in, and finally they're surrounded, and then they then they move further east for another several hundred years. Yeah, slowly but surely losing their power. Make application? Yeah, we could. But I won't today. Um, notice verse 5. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Does God miss anything in your life? Does God miss anything in, in, a, in any, a country's life? No, it, he does not. And he says, he remembered them. He remembered all of her iniquities. Now it's payday. How does the New Testament describe you reap what you sow? You reap what you sow. You sow the flesh, you reap fleshly consequences. Sow the spirit, you reap spiritual benefits. That's, that's a universal uh, truth. Was then, was now, or in Revelation 17 and 18, all of that, and, it, and it's true today. It's true today. We've already answered uh, this question number four on page two. I was actually trying to get 
You notice I'm repeating questions one, two, and three again. They're different questions. This wouldn't let me change the number. Should have called Brian about that. <laughs> so we'll go with page two, question one. And uh, question two, um, on page two, because her sins had piled up as high as heaven, what was God going to do to the harlot? You know, this Rome is, is, is described as a harlot, and we understand what, what, what the implications of that. What's he going to do? What's he going to do to her? It's going to be plagues, and said, um, "I'll throw you into the bed of iniquity, where you'll reap." All, and he said that before already in the Book of Revelation. Uh, but he said, "You're um, it, it's payday now." Look at verse. We'll probably get through about verse six. Might go to verse seven. Depends on my time. I can't hardly see the clock looking in that light. What would God's judgment on the harlot uh, cause the world to do? This is interesting. Verses 9 through 19. What were some of, I don't want to get too far ahead, but what were some of the reactions by when one Annette, Annette was saying that from the commerce side, from the morality side, from all of that, what were their reactions as this fall starts to take place? They, they, were, they were mourning. Were they amazed, Gary? They, they, they were amazed at what is going on. The most powerful economy in the world. Now they're shaving silver off of the coins so they don't have to spend as much silver. Uh, they're, and same with, with some of the gold. <clears throat> uh, and the people who had relied on this great country, similarities today, maybe, um, they're amazed at what's taking place in Rome. What's taking place in the United States? People are amazed. <coughs> Questions or comments? Look at verse, okay, well, this will be the last one. Let's look at verse 7. I didn't see any hands. If I did, I apologize. In the, me in the measure that she glor glorified herself and lived luxuriously in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, no, notice the arrogance here. I sit as a queen. I'm not a widow. And I will not see sorrow. What was Rome's attitude? That may happen to other people. You know, I'm the queen of the world, and I, and I will never be a widow. So, widow. I will never see sorrow. I've said this before. Well, let me ask the question. When we go through this life, has anybody in here never had sorrows, heartaches, problems? Anybody, ha anybody in here raise your hand if you haven't? Oh, that's right, I don't see any. <laughs> me too. You've either had these things or it's on the way to your front door. If you have not had it, it's coming. And then we'll see who the true Christians are and who, who, who's not when the problems hit. And they're coming. She thought she had that attitude, too. It's never going to happen to me. God says, you're going to be a widow, too. You're going to be a widow, too. It's coming to you. But she was arrogant. Rome was arrogant. Our leaders can be arrogant. Our country can be arrogant. Remember in Obadiah, Obadiah 4, 4, I believe? People said, the Edomites, I believe, we're going to build our dwellings up in the rocks where the eagles fly. We're good now. What did God say? I'll bring you down. I'll bring you down. You can't go too high or too deep or too far for God to bring you down. And he wipes all arrogant smiles off of everybody's faces eventually. Just like he did with the Edomites. I'm up where the eagles fly. Nobody bought it. Made out of solid rock. It fell. It fell. Obadiah 4, 
uh, look at that maybe when you, uh, <clears throat> when you get home. Our last verse, 2 Samuel 22. This won't take but a second, then I'll stop. 2 Samuel 22 and verse 28. 2 Samuel 22 and verse 28. Here we are. Samuel says, <clears throat> talking about God, you will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. Do you believe that's true? The Bible says it's true. And he gives example after example. My mother used to say, I, uh, I'll wipe that smile off your face. My sister knows that. You know, you're 14, you pretty much got it all figured out. And I'd, I'd, I'd give a little smirky smile. You probably used that. And, uh, and she said, number one, your dad would be home after a while. But number two, I'll wipe that smirky smile off your face. And she was very capable of doing that. And did it. God's saying that. Don't get haughty with me, God's saying. As an individual, as a country, or as the world, because he said, I'll wipe it off your face. He got no time for haughtiness. But he said, he got a lot of time for humility. And that's where we got to be. That's where we got to be. Is that easy to do? It's not. It's not, but that's what we have to do. Don, you want to close us out with something? Okay, good point. He knows just exactly how to handle the bad person. That's right. That's right. He's a little smarter than they are. All right. Uh, I know there's quite a bit of history there, but that's okay. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit. We'll pick up with verse um, 8 on Wednesday night. We'll finish it up. Finish up at least 18.